Hi, Eric. Welcome to Startup Grind. Well, thank you, Jens. It's great to be here with you. I know you've been with us before, and uh, we did a, an event together with about Agile. Yes, I remember that. That was fun. And tonight we're going to look at something different. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, this is actually, a, it's from an episode of my podcast, the Education Innovators podcast. And I had a chance to talk with the folks from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University about a facility they set up, really. It's, it's called The Hive, the uh, Hybrid Immersive Virtual Environment. But what I think is really interesting about this discussion, and, and I know we're going to listen to it um, afterwards here, is that although it's a very technical thing that they implemented and the tech is very cool, uh, and I love tech, but uh, what I really found, and I think what our listeners will find, is that the the really interesting thing is that their success with this is much more based on collaboration and cross-discipline uh, cooperation uh, across the campus here with multiple different players from different departments contributing to it. Um, and it, it's really, really amazing what these guys have been able to do. Uh, it was a great panel, so I, I hope everybody enjoys listening to this. And then we can have a discussion later and kind of talk about you know some of what I took away from that as well. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. So uh, without further ado, we move on to the podcast. And after that, you and I are going to have also a talk on Startup Grind about how to run a podcast and your learnings from that. Great. Looking forward to it. Welcome to the Education Innovators Podcast. I'm Eric Byron, and it is my privilege to host this show where I get to talk to folks from all over the world who are helping bring education into the 21st century. We'll hear inspiring stories from educators and edtech founders, and AI experts, and others who are fearlessly innovating and delivering creative, unique learning experiences. I'm glad you're here. Let's get started. Well, welcome to the Education Innovators Podcast. I am Eric Byron, and this is a special episode. I have four guests with me today from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University to talk about the Hive. That's the hybrid immersive virtual environment that they built on campus. And uh, just for a little bit of background and why we're doing this, why I'm so excited about doing this episode. So I met Dr. Cheryl Lee at the EdTech Month event back in October. There she is waving, yay, Sarah. And, um, and they were receiving an award actually for this project. And Shara invited me to come out and experience the hive myself, which I did. And it was awesome, right? So, and I, I want you all to kind of, imagine, right? It's hard to visualize such things, but imagine a classroom that can hold up to 40 people. And this classroom can transform. It can transport you to, let's say, a remote village in Borneo or a, um, a giant warehouse facility. It can be a museum in Paris that you can walk around amongst the artifacts. Um, it can be the inside of the um, International Space Station, or as we'll talk about later, another example, it can be a hospital treatment facility, right? A, a room in a hospital. And so um, I got to experience all of this and walk around in it. You don't need 3D glasses, you can wear them. Um, and you also do not need a VR headset. And, and we're gonna talk later about why that's a significant um, important element of the design of this thing and the experience uh, for the students uh, who are in this environment. So. Let's jump right in. So Cheryl was was waving earlier. So Dr. Cheryl Lee, she was my initial contact here with this project. Um, Cheryl's expertise is actually in radiation therapy and something called, uh, I'm going to read my note here, photobiomodulation. So, and I understand this is something to do with um, actually the minimizing the, um, uh, uh, what is it, the, oh, I, um, side Double effects. Side, side effects, effects. That's um, what I was looking for. Right? Has a treatment. Yeah. So, so sorry. Without, I mean, I'm sure it's kind of over all of our heads. But can you tell us just a little bit about that work and and the importance of photobiomodulation? 
Oh, okay. So uh, before we move on with the hive, uh, yeah. basically I uh, I graduated as a radiation therapist and I spent years of uh, conducting research in various disciplines. So uh, basically for, for the biomodulation is a non-invasive uh, modality that would help to alleviate side effects associated with cancer therapy, particularly radiation therapy, because patients, for instance, whenever they receive radiation therapy, uh, the area that is being irradiated will suffer from um, damages. And these damages, for example, will be skin reactions, like when you have serious sunburn. Mm. Or, for example, if there is, you know, treatment in the head and neck area, um, the patient may have oral mucositis. So it's like inflammation of your oral cavity. So um, yeah. this photobound modulation, consider that as a very low level laser. This laser will help you to prevent very serious damage to the irradiated area. So I think that's the very basic concepts of photobound modulation. Well, very cool work. And uh um, right. Well, I know you're going to share later a use case for the hive that's just absolutely yeah. fascinating and and yeah, it, it's emotional. We'll <laughs> get there uh, <laughs> um, for me. It's it's a great great story. All right, uh, Doctor Jackie Chung. So uh, you're an interesting guy, J Jackie. So uh, your bio says you're an expert in construction 3D printing. But you <laughs> but you've yes. also you know you um well you've received eleven research and teaching awards and you've published like eighty two research papers um but I'm curious and your involvement in this project the the hive was not three d printed right uh I'll say is uh what you mentioned it was my history uh, okay. uh Personally, I'm into training. I used to be a construction professional in the context of years. Uh, I did. Uh, I have over seventeen teaching experience in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, I used to be a research interest in about uh, project management, construction project management. But mm. in 2015, uh, when I was working in Singapore NUS, uh, I start my new uh, research area is about construction three D printing, and in 2019. Um, I relocated back from Singapore to Hong Kong, and I joined my uh, existing department is Industrial Center. Now uh, I'm serving as a senior engineering manager here. So, and then uh, because our center would provide uh, uh, teaching support in the university, so that's why uh, I need a team uh, to submit a proposal uh, to develop different kind of university technologies for teaching, in particular for uh, the hybrid, um, the hybrid interactive virtual environment is one of our key projects, yeah. So you proposed this? Uh, yes, this, this is our dream. Um, right. Because yeah, It's on it you, is, Jackie. Uh, you did this, right? <laughs> uh, not only me, the ball it's our rolling. team. Yeah, because yes. maybe I can share a bit more background about uh, what is Hive and what's the reason yeah. why yeah, we we're, we're gonna We're going to get Hive. there. Yeah. Actually, that's my first First yeah. question, you are up <laughs> for that, but let's yeah. um, let's get the introductions sure. <laughs> done first. So, um, uh, Dr. Kai Pan Mark, <laughs> we'll go by KP, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so you're an educational development officer there, and I love your background because you have a dual background in IT and education. Yeah. So, like, high five, you and I are of... <laughs> kindred spirit here uh, my background as well and but oh and you're the the current chair of the IEEE Hong Kong section education chapter I thought that was yes. impressive your work with the IEEE there um, but I spotted a thing in your bio about effectively applying student co-created content mm -hmm. can you elaborate a little bit on that what does that mean well uh, let me talk about my uh, personal background and okay. then to uh, to share with you some of my uh, encounters. I've been, uh, I started my career and my under associate degree and uh, bachelor's degree training purely on the technical side as in uh, city use computer studies. So I'm 100% trained at that level as a pure, you know, a technologist. And then I started my teaching here in PolyU as a very junior teaching assistant grade, a tutor grade, and then I 
had very close relationship with my students. And then at that time, you know that uh, there's a, there's a, I would say my our observers, observation is that students are more keen on technologies than we do. Even though at that time I was old. I was only, say, uh, 23, 24 years old. And then my students and I, our uh, age difference, is only two, three, four years or so. Mm -hmm. But they move their technology knowledge and their sensitivity was great, really great. And then beyond us. So they gave us ideas. And then, the, for example, the course, the assessment design, the assignment, well, the latest technology could uh, could uh, be more effective than you thought be. So that's the starting point. Uh, that was about 20 years ago. That was the starting point. So we treasure the input of the students in creating these assignments, and students even suggest the ways to do the uh, to to create content to support their learning. Let me go back to some encounters when I was. Uh, during my PhD studies, uh, I was involved in a course of uh, microbiology in uh, City U, and we designed activities or e-learning activities on adopting the mobile devices for students to capture the pictures of uh, trees, infected trees by the microorganisms, the fungi in their communities. And students were happy to do the sharing. And one student even suggested us that, why don't we make a QR code and then to showcase the trees and the professor adopted this idea. And students did that happen. And uh, students even after a few years and they reunion with the professors, they still mentioned that activities. So the engagement is very important. And then the time progresses, and now technology, multimedia creation, is so easy to use and so affordable. And then we treasure student-staff partnership, and they provide input, uh, very valuable input to teachers, their fellow students. And once they are become alumni, they give input and sharings to their junior students as well. So this is the key of the... Uh, Staff, the student staff partnership. And then uh, that's also my encounters before that model was mature. Awesome. No, that's really, really important stuff. Engagement is so key in, uh, in education here. And well, also in the yeah. interdisciplinary collaboration. And that's important. Yes. Yes. Well said. All right. And last but not least, we have Dr. Rodney Chu. So uh, with a master and doctor in philosophy, he is the chair of the uh, Applied Social Sciences Department on their learning and teaching committee since 2013. And uh, again, in your uh, bio there, Rodney, I spotted a, a thing on pedagogy design um, in blended learning and flipped classroom. So talk to me a little bit about that. Oh, yeah, I just want to cut the story short. I'm the DLTC chair for some time, and one of the goals or one of the objectives of, of myself is try to um, um, to push the entire level of the teaching and learning um, horizon of my colleagues um, a bit different from what um, they used to be. Um, I, I think it's somewhat related with what um, KB has just mentioned about the 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 difference with the dynamics between the staff, uh, between the teaching staff and the students. I always believe that, um, well, I, I, I make use of two phrases. I mean, the digital migrant and digital natives to describe the, the teachers and the students. I believe that um, as a teacher, um, other than trying to teach some sort of knowledge base of what one is of uh, belonging to the expertise, on the other hand, uh, the students of the current cohort, they have a lot of exposure that when we were young, we could never have got that. So I, I would be, believe that um, this kind of um, understanding from the staff side on what the other side could be would be a little bit more, um, uh, getting a bit more positive interaction between the two, two, two most important stakeholders in the, in, the, in the university. I'm talking about the students and staff and teachers. 
And with all these, uh, if this can be done uh, on the L and T level, that is learning and teaching, this could be having a lot of butterfly effect. So um, my entire uh, mission as a DLT teacher is trying to to move forward um, the kind of um, exposure and experience of both sides um, in this kind of um, L and T endeavors or endeavors, put it that way. So um, um, this is why you see my concern or my um, so-called path of the past few years or so is on this area. That's what I would, would like to share this moment. All right. So I, I want to point out that it's really interesting to me. And again, we I've talked to a bunch of folks at um, on all kind of aspects of education. You know, my podcast is about innovation and education. And so here we, so we seem to have this great collection of folks who view education as something that um, we can innovate, right? You guys are all seem to be of this mindset of we're going to go do something different here. So from Jackie, you know, proposing the hive and, you know, KP doing the, um, uh, student generated content and you know Rodney with the you know blended learning and, and flipped classroom and Akar Shara is doing some really really interesting things we're going to talk about later with the use of the hive um in the radiation uh, radiology um student uh, education there so um but let's jump in and talk a little bit about what is this hive thing so so Jackie uh, give us some some insight here what is this thing and how is it built Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, Hives is um, a term created by our university. It's called Hybrid Interactive Virtual Environment. But indeed, the Hive is developed based on uh, an existing technology called CAVE, CAVE Automatic Virtual Environment. So uh, the CAVE um, is a small box with uh, usually uh, it's around two meter time, two meter time, two meters, and with four screen displays. A uh, cave was invented by univers U.S. University in 1992 uh, to facilitate a one-to-many visualization. Because for hammer display, it's only for single user, but for this one, it's for one-to-many. So that means inside the box, um, we can support multiple user. And in Hong Kong, uh, for our university, uh, we firstly uh, introduced uh, the cave for research purposes in around 2016. Uh, happy to share that is now uh, our university, the Hong Kong University. We have nine case right now. It should be the highest number in Hong Kong. So you can see is our university. Um, the uh, senior manager put a lot of effort um, to promote the immersive technology for teaching. And in around year 2000, um, happy that is our department has been appointed by our senior management to serve as a central facility. So we provide technical support for this immersive technology for teaching. So that's why we introduced the first cave in our department. So, but uh, we use it for more than one year. We realized the existing technology will have some problems. First of all, the size two meter times two meter times two meter is too small for teaching because we usually, we have suppose we have a class of 30 students. For the cave itself, each time can accommodate maybe four to five students. So that's why we have to break the class into small groups. Group one come first and the other student, they yeah. are waiting. So the problem is uh, affect or interrupt the teaching because um, when students are waiting, they do nothing. So that's why it's not good for teaching. The other one is the cave itself is too small. So that's why in the virtual environment, if I jump from A point to B point, uh, usually uh, the user need to use a remote controller to point from jump from A to B. So they don't have good experience. They cannot walk through. And the third problem is the most uh, challenging part because the cave usually have only four screen, front screen, left, right, and the bottom. So that's why once you look up, or you look right backward, you will leave the virtual environment. Right, breaks so, the illusion, yeah. Yes, so because of this reason, uh, we have a dream, and then because our team, we talk to our boss, hey, shall we have a five-side, five five-screen? My point is, looks good, 
And then we ask for, then you better to have six. So that's why we create a fully immersive. Six screen means front, back, left, right, ceiling, and floor. They're screens. So why this six size is so important? Because uh, when you, in the virtual environment, when, when you come across some tall subject, for example, a statue, if we don't have the ceiling screen, what you see, look up, the statue cut in half, two half. You can only see the lower half. So this is, we create a poor user experience. So that's why, uh, first of all, we have an idea is create called fully immersive kit environment. So that means the user, no matter where you turn around your head, you're still inside the virtual environment. And the second idea is because we found is because we want to promote this technology, we must facilitate the teacher to use it for teaching. So that's why after discussion with our user, uh, we propose to have the hybrid, we are, we are our hybrid classroom. That means we combine a general teaching classroom setting together with this we are K facilities. So that's why for the teacher, they only need to swap the mode. The student, you can bring the student between physical uh, classroom environment and bring them into what? The virtual environment. Because usually for teacher, they would use this environment for, uh, let's say for three hours teaching. They won't use real environment for the whole three hours. Maybe they show them something. So this hybrid classroom design facilitates the teacher and user to jump in and jump up between um, physical environment and virtual environment. And then because of this- right, I want to just jump in and yeah. make sure that was, was clear, right, to our, our audience here. So what you're talking about is at times, the room just looks like a classroom. Right, you can yes, have correct. chairs and the teachers doing a presentation, uh, you know, kind of lecturing, yes. if you will. They can have their PowerPoint displayed on the wall, yes. you know, kind of thing, and, and talking to it. And then they flip a switch, and yes, the room correct. transforms into yes. a virtual environment. Right. Yes. Um, to make it simple, imagine this is a general classroom for forty students. All the wall turn into a screen, and that's all. Yeah. So that's why the teacher can change the physical classroom environment swap between a uh, physical and virtual environment. A uh, student, they can stay there. They can sit on chair or sit on ground or stand. They don't need to move from one place to another place. Yeah, the so there, there was another teaching. aspect I thought was very interesting too, the kind of the hybrid nature of it is you can also have physical things in the room that yes, correct. align with the virtual environment. So it's kind of a combination of um, yes, yeah, yes. both physical Hopefully. and virtual uh, elements. Yes, correct. Uh, because our idea we developed, um, we call, because original, the kit itself is for only pure virtual environment because it's too small. You can't bring any physical item inside. So that's why once we have this big, uh, hive system, it allows us to bring in uh, the physical items. Yeah, maybe um, I think uh, Dr. Sarah uh, should explain a bit more because the room is big enough for you to carry um, the bed or some furniture. So that's why if that's the case, the cave itself, we use the wall to create a virtual environment and we put the real item inside that. Yeah. To a certain extent, is similar to the Hollywood movie. The background itself is an LED wall, and in front, they put a car. Right, right. Kind of the green the screen yeah. thing. Right, yes. Where, uh, yes yeah, but they, they, they don't and real. Yeah. use green screen. They use exactly the LED screen, like us. We use projector. So yeah. you see the um, your, your project image, the environment, yeah, yeah. on the wall. So... Uh, because we come up of this idea and then we submit a proposal to our university senior management. Uh, for the high projects, it costs 1.5 million US dollars. It's around 12 million dollars. Uh, this is probably innovation. Uh, our team worked with a local company. We jointly developed this. Uh, we spent 18 months because it's very, very challenging. Um, in this project, we come across uh, two major challenges. The first one is 
because I mentioned this is hybrid room, uh, it is very, very difficult to combine the, um, the room facility, for example, fire system, firefighting system, air con, together with this projection system. Because imagine is the wall, we, we use the wall as screen. So we try to minimize all opening because if not, we'll affect the image quality. So we spend a lot of effort in design. And also the other one is the VR technology because it is very, very rare uh, to have any companies or university to have six sides because to, in total, we have 15 projectors. Uh, for VR, we have total 30 screen. Um, our technical team, we connect this 30 screen into a spherical shape ball. So that one we spent over 12 months uh, to create a method to achieve this. And the deliverable is uh, very encouraging. Um, our room is 56 meters square. 56. Yeah, and it's trapezoidal, which um, I, I thought was yes. very clever in, in the way you designed it so that it kind of masks the projectors. You, you don't yes. see the projectors or get that like kind of bright light in your eye at any point. Um, you realize yes. you're walking in front of a projector. The, yeah. the design is uh, in a physical uh, general teaching classroom, we create an inner box. The box itself is surface, the screen. We put all the projector between this inner box and the room, so as to, uh, to hide all projector and other facilities. So the uh, good thing is we are big enough. So that's why we can accommodate a single class up to 30 students. Yeah, the second is because uh, the breakthrough is we create a huge virtual space. So that's why uh, the user can enjoy walk through. They don't need necessarily to use the remote control to jump from point A to B. They can walk around. Yeah. So yeah, I experienced if, that. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not see anything similar in the world so far. Allow user to walk through. Because um, some industrial partner, for example, the previous, uh developer, they are also very interested because uh, Hong Kong, the flat network size is around maybe 40 to 50 meters square. By doing this, uh, we can create the whole complete cell flat. So the user can walk through from dining room to living room to toilet. So this is a very unique experience. Uh, and also, to one I mentioned before, so that's why the student uh, teacher, they no need to swap. And the last thing is fully immersive. This six side will create excellent experience. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I think the I other think... thing that just really impressed me was not only walk around and, and this, you know, within the context of what we were talking about earlier and, um, you know, interaction engagement stuff, right, is the students can interact with each other, right? So they're experiencing yes, this together. Right, it's not a unique experience. It's I can talk to each other. I can see, you know, what um, maybe the teacher is pointing out. Um, right, so it's yes. very engaging in that a shared experience, um, learning yeah. together. Right. First of all, um, because it support multiple users. Because sometimes is we use Hammond display or something like that. I can only play alone. So that's why here you have the company. So it creates a much stronger sense of belongings. And also, this is a real environment. Yeah, and also yeah. allow you work full. But now we have this. Uh, the good thing is uh, we can support teachers to allow, first of all, uh, practical training, practical teaching. Because, for example, uh, for our, our university, we have aviation program. It is difficult to bring students to copy it. So now, by doing this, we can capture the 360 uh, video and we show it to the student. I think you facilitate called internationalization. So the student, they don't need the campus. We can bring them to different place for learning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and awesome. also the second, um, it will facilitate group learning as well, because you mentioned uh, we support a group of users. So that's why they can discuss and talk to each other. And also the good thing is for this, we can use this one to create different scenario, like maybe uh, Dr. Sarah, she'll explain a bit more. So it's more than procedure-wise. We create, for example, we are working on is um, firefighting exercise. So usually for real system, they just, okay, we have five fire extinguisher. Which one do you prefer for uh, 
type A file, type B file. Now we can make use of the system. We create, oh, in case of fire, you run away or you use the fire extinguisher or you want to, I mean, we can provide situation to train up the student is higher level decision making. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. So many use cases, it, it's really fascinating. Um, so uh, Yes, because it's now uh, for this hive, if I'm correct, uh, it, the application has covered over 80% of department in our university uh, from engineering to construction to even for health or even to English department. They also made yeah. use of this too for teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, so that takes me to, to Rodney. I want to ask Rodney a, kind of a follow-up question on this. So please unmute. <laughs> and um, let's... Uh, I, I want to understand what you are hoping to get out of this, right? So it's one thing to decide you're going to go build this thing, but what outcome were you looking for in this project? Well, um, well, um, actually, my department joins in the kind of beating of this funding with IC, who was the leader of the entire 1.2, uh, a 12 million Hong Kong dollar project. And to be very honest, at the start, I have no knowledge about all this cave or hive whatsoever. Um, 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 because to me, uh, what I've been doing in my department is trying to, as I've said just now, trying to move the entire LNT horizon to a, to a, to a so-called new normal perspective. Um, because I don't want uh, my department to try, I, I don't want uh, my staff or my students um, to try to go back to the back to normal kind of status. Uh, because if even after the COVID, we should understand that um, for the LNT for or for the new generation, it must be trying to bring them closer to what they are going to 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 come across with when they really uh, steps out from the university when they graduate. Mm -hmm. So when everybody when when around the world is going that way, I mean, how can we still stick to our original way of trying to learn, learn and teach? So, um, so when when I came across with the entire physical construct of the hive or the cave, it became it became to me that um, it is very important to to bring about uh, some kind of new experience to our students. But to do this, you must you must bring new experience to the staff first, because if the staff do not want to try it, you never got the chance for the students to try. It. Right. So, um, um, actually, I mean during the the, the period when the high was being constructed, I mean, I'm talking about the entire 2022 year, from January to to November, put it this way. Uh, I've been trying to prepare my colleagues to try to uh, get acquainted with what is what it would be uh, meant by uh, introducing uh, immersive technologies into our our L and T um, environment. So, um, and also I have to prepare some students to try to um, um, be a kind of assistance when the entire project uh, implements. And this on this kind of SSP, I will leave it to, I mean, the staff student co uh, uh, partnership, I will leave it to KP to elaborate. So, so uh, once the hype came into existence, I say, um, well, we, we could always imagine that uh, some of the hard science departments could make best use of the hype. Um, to, to, for example, if I'm building construction, I try to bring in the construction site into the hive, things like that. Mm -hmm. But for social science subjects, it, it could be quite different because um, you you could really talk with the students even without all this kind of so-called environment. So um, um, my entire idea was to bring the students out of the classroom so that they can make use of some of the facilities that we would provide, for example, um, like the sprinkle cameras and all this kind of uh, various um, um, equipments to try to capture something outside from the community or from, from the society and bring back in to the hive. And this also explains one of the question that maybe some some of our colleagues here will, will uh, elaborate later. That is the difference between cave and the so-called HMD, what you have been mentioned about the head-mounted display. Because yeah. hive or cave is giving a kind of collective exposure and experience at the same time for all those who are inside the cave or hive, mm -hmm. especially when we are talking about the hive. So I can easily put the students on the so-called Oculus and they may see the same environment, but it is a kind of individual experience of what is being immersed into. 
yeah. but for this hive or cave, it is so different. And this kind of difference is meaning a lot to the kind of so-called impression of the students and for the kind of so-called um, um, uh, deep learning and deep exposure of a certain environment. For example, one of our um, elaboration, one of, the, uh, one of our clip uh, put into the um, in, in this 3D dimension is what we call um, the, um, the so-called um, uh, subdivided housing in Hong Kong. So mm. the students cannot go into that kind of area because it's so crowded, so small. So once you put the, you make use of the spherical camera to capture that and then let the students embed it into the environment, it will be so different for them. And especially the kind of difference if we are talking about the feeling of it together rather than to, to the feeling of it just by putting on an Oculus. Right, right. So, so to us, Oculus has a different purpose. It is a movable cave or a movable hive if we want it to be in that sense and if we want to do it separate functions. But there must be certain reasons for the hive to, to, to be there to give another kind of exposure. And this kind of exposure has a very, very important or different meaning, a pedagogical meaning. So they use the hive, for example, by my subjects um, uh, to, to let other students to go out and then bring some of the um, uh, environment into, um, the scene, into the setting. I could still remember how some of the students um, uh, were, were a bit um, amazed when being seen, when being shown by the uh, three six row videos by some other some other students captured in their sites, so yeah. this kind of exposure and experience could never been um, uh, got by students when they were still in the past ages of using a very simple tools or even watching the TV through a two dimensional manner. So I think this uh, the entire different stuff, um, um, content that I could share here. Yeah, awesome. KP, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, feedback and response on on campus. What are what are faculty saying about trying to teach in this environment? What what are the students saying as well? Well, uh, there are two ways of utilizing the uh, cave or high facilities. Uh, in the more conventional or the common way, that's for teachers to present content, for example, videos in some of the more dangerous or restricted areas, say the uh, inside the building, there are some uh, power supply infrastructures and uh, some for the engineering students, and then they cannot access these easily. And then so they play the video. So students have, they have an idea and have an immersive experience on, say, the uh, fire protection facilities and all those areas. So this is the conventional way, playing content of students. The other way run is we ask students to create immersive content with 360 videos. We lend them the equipment and perform some uh, shooting and playing the, their videos in the hive or cave and immediately share and present with their fellow students. So now, are we talking? Yeah. Sorry, are we talking about like a GoPro? I mean, what kind of equipment are we talking about the students using to capture? Oh, simply a uh, 360 camera. Okay. 360 camera, yes. Very simple one. Now, uh, we cannot use so uh, sophisticated equipment because this is not a media production course. These are students generally outside the uh, engineering faculty. Right. And we need to cater the learning curve and their digital literacy. We are not asking them to create very high quality video, but our rule of thumb is good enough to be shared. Yeah. And how much effort yeah. is it to take that uh, 360 video they capture and, and drop it in the room? Is it pretty straightforward? Is there a bunch of editing or uh, translation, tran you know, yeah, this is another example, another showcase of student partnership. We rely on student helpers and past students to deliver training to those current students. Very simple, just create a video and drop uh, and uh, upload or drop it to the uh, Hive system and then that's it. So students, they sit around in the Hive and then they play the video and then they give comments and they can point to this one, point to this one. 
looking at the details and ask mm. questions and respond uh, very actively in the high school. So yeah. we ask students to decide, for example, in uh, Dr. Rodney Ju's course, we ask students to decide their own field trip. This is about the uh, urbanization in different areas. Mm. So they go to different parts of Hong Kong and take 360 videos and they play and share their field trip experience. So students will ask their peers and they even look at the very detailed part of the videos and then so they initiate a discussion. So that was very well received by the students and then that, that's the initiative that, uh, they, that was attractive to the panel and we got the reimagine award and also the uh, hero. This is one piece of evidence and yeah. examples of it. Well, I think this, this is also a really important point about the uh, effectiveness of this environment, right? And the ability to create content. Because when you talk about VR, right? The, uh, you know, creating a VR experience is not a simple, you know, task, right? It's not totally rocket science, but it's not um, quite so easy as just going out and capturing with a GoPro, a 360 video and being able to, to bring it into the environment. So I think that that ease of generating content and, and student created content and their ability to share it uh, themselves uh, in there. I think that's just a beautiful example too of the flexibility of what you guys have created and why you've received so many uh, awards. Uh, I, I haven't actually mentioned them, although I do have some notes in, in the uh, show notes uh, about at least one of the ones you got recently. So th this has been you know, a, a great, a great project. All right. Yeah, Eric, uh, this Jackie, can I also add a point? Uh, because um, when we initiate these projects, um, we, we, we have the unexpected um, advantage outcome because CAVE in the past is usually only focused on we are model created by Unity. We need a complicated um, programming technique to create right. virtual environment to add the interactive action. So, but now in the Hive, um, our major user, most of them, they adopt um, uh, an alternative way we call is uh, cinema mode, as you mentioned. Uh, the merit of this one is easy to use. I mean, as uh, mentioned by Mark, uh, the user just need to take an ordinary 360 camera. So, they can, no matter staff or student, they can create content easily. They just need to, just like camera, start and stop. And also I appreciate like uh, Ronnie and some colleagues, they also provide the camera to student. So it's not only hardware, it's the whole pedagogy and solution. And the second part is um, the system itself uh, is also easy. Just you, as mentioned by Mark, just upload the file and click play. So that means even secondary students, they can manage to use this um, technology or facility. Yeah. yeah. So, but and this is, I call it, is the merit of the cave. So, uh, and facility to get the popularity because without, and also this is connect creation because we also realize um, on internet, in particular, like YouTube or any, many uh, website they can also provide the free content. So you just, for example, go to YouTube and do the search, you can get 360 video. There's also plenty of materials for uh, to, for teaching purposes, yeah. Yeah, so I wanna make um, one other kind of distinction here. We, we've been making this reference back and forth kind of between you know the cave technology and head-mounted yeah. display. And, um, and, and Shara, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. There are certainly use cases for for VR, right? And, and one of the things I think of is in VR, because I'm using Unity 3D or something, I can create a, a environment that doesn't exist, right? Whereas I got to go out with a 3D camera, I'm creating, you know, I'm catching imagery of, of real world um, versus virtual world. So, but, but Chara, talk a little bit about the, the difference here in the experience of, you know, being in the cave environment versus um, a head mounted, like an Oculus. VR. 
I think I'm the best person to talk about it because uh, <laughs> indeed I'm not using any head mounted display for all my projects working in the hive. So okay. uh, I won't say the the you know the ugly side of it, but I I would like to say that you know for all my projects, um, the H, um the head mounted display would be a resistance or I would say a disadvantage because in my project it enhances I mean it highlights the importance of peer interaction or interaction among users within the same room. So as mentioned, uh, Hive is actually quite a big room that can cater 40 people. So it's very important that when people or like, you know, audience experience in the Hive, it is important that they interact. Um, so I think, you know, first of all, it enhances peer interactions without the use of hand-mounted display. Secondly, for myself, I'm not wearing eyeglass, but four of you are wearing eyeglasses. So uh, I would like to say that whenever I wear eyeglasses, even sunglasses, it hinders me from, from having a very good spatial sense. So I think not wearing a head mounted, you know, display really eliminates problem of spatial orientation, particularly, for example, like kids or the elderly, they may experience difficulties in adjusting to the environment. So uh, the realism will be much higher. For example, I um, in my um, sections, I need students to do hands-on skills. Uh, with the uh, goggles, you can't really mimic the realism associated with skills acquisition. So this is one very important point. And I find it like, it's still like truly immersive without really using anything, um, you know, wearing anything in, in, in my yeah. eyes. So I think that's the key points. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, we've all worn Oculus, and well, maybe not everybody who's listening, but I certainly have. Um, and and yes, it can be somewhat disorienting. You know, even vertigo kind of um, symptoms sometimes, uh, and, and limited amount of time. Right? You, if you wear them for a short period, it may be okay, but the longer you wear them, the more likely you are to start having some of these spatial, um, you know, issues. So, um, yeah, I think that's also an important aspect of this is the ability. Um, now, I will admit, in the the hive, um, there were times uh, you guys uh, showed me a thing like with a roller coaster ride, right? You're kind of sitting there, and there's a roller coaster. You can still get some of that spatial, you know, thing going on there, a little dizzying, um, disorienting because it really feels like, you know, your your vision tricks you, right? You believe, right? You're really moving, so. Um, so you, you can still experience some of that kind of phenomenon even without the, the goggles. So uh, we all have to you know, be a little bit yeah. wary. And of that just one. imagine, I can always invite the participants to get, get into the room and enjoy the roller coaster together without finding another hollow lens or head mounted display in order to, for a newcomer to enjoy. So I think that also, you know, literally yeah. eliminates the barrier, you know, of having new yeah. participants. Well, exactly. I was time. there, and you guys did this. Is like, boom! It's a roller coaster. Boom! It's a fly through Disney. You know, whatever, right? It's, I'm out in some remote village somewhere. Um, you know, you can really uh, change things very, very quickly uh, to to meet yeah. the the needs of of somebody. Yeah. But so, Shar, I want to get into your use case here because we've been kind of teasing, right? That uh, you've got this interesting use case. So. Um, mm. Share a little bit with us the, the story you shared with me about the work you're doing with young uh, cancer patients. Uh, something to start with. Uh, I just want to have like, you know, 30 seconds to, yeah. to, to um, you know, to uh, share how I started the story. I treated Hive as a Toys R Us for me because I, I never <laughs> worked with Industrial Center until I got to know Jackie in an occasion. And he introduced to me, like, you know, the manager of this Toys R Us. And eventually I, I just started playing with this hive. Uh, I have been working with um, my colleagues because um, I, you know, I train as a radiation therapist and I'm teaching or training students to become local radiation therapists. So we are um, treating or managing cancer patients every day. And we realized that during the COVID outbreak, uh, we realized that uh, the kids, uh, particularly those uh, with cancer requiring radiation therapy, uh, could not receive the preparation um, prepared, you know, like, you know, uh, given by social workers within the hospital setting because of all those isolations and restrictions. And then we we're just thinking, oh, maybe our campus will be able to address the barrier. 
So uh, we, I work with the students and also the academic staff together with the hospital radiation therapists uh, to create a preparation service, or I would say a gamified workshop to educate you know, cancer children and also carers, preparing them for the radiotherapy journey. So um, this one, as I mentioned, is in the COVID period. So Hive has not yet been born. So we are simply using a classroom with one-sided projectors, uh, adding on some toys and you know materials to mimic the realistic environment. But of course, you know that you know it's it's just a projector. You know, it's just a picture. Yeah. So it it is not really that realistic. So I realized that maybe we can incorporate this project to put it in the Hive. And that's what we are. Uh, we have been doing. So um, I know that I don't want to make a very long story, but for the audience who may not know what is radiation therapy, it's a treatment that you need to attend the hospital. Uh, attend to the hospital every single day, spending time like fifteen to thirty minutes in a room that is huge and very cold, all by yourself for thirty minutes. So for an adult, uh, one of the major challenges is that you have to lie flat and stay still. You can't really move at all throughout the entire treatment in order to ensure accuracy of, you know, this radiation shooting at the tumor. And for kids, you will find that this is more challenging. You, it's very difficult to leave a kid in the room all by themselves and not moving. So uh, most of the time, they require anesthesia or putting them to sleep. And this is not good because the children who require uh, anesthesia need to be fast for at least four to six hours. They are already very sick children. They are not eating well, they are not feeling well, and you can't feed them breakfast every single day until the next meal will be dinner because most of them are feeling very dizzy and uncomfortable after anesthesia. So we want to prepare them better so that they can cooperate and we don't need to put them to sleep. And that's the uh, essence of this project. And that would be a rehearsal. So as Jackie mentioned, Hive can make it like a highly realistic and with uh, KP's and Rodney's description talking about we just need a camera. So we have engineers from the industrial center to bring these high uh, camera to the hospital and take 360 videos and pictures and get projected in the hive. So we have this projection together with all these resources like, you know, uh, Eric has just mentioned the roller coaster ride. So you can imagine that with these resources and with the essential button uh, uh, within the hive that was just a press of it, you can change the um, the environment. So we have our students, undergraduate radiation therapy students, to create a gamified storyline personalized to the kids' needs. For example, she he's a Pokemon lover, for instance. We'll create a story of Pokemon together with other um, you know, other things that he likes, so that we will try to train him to lie flat in the couch all by himself without putting him to sleep because the treatment itself is actually not painful. It's more like cooperation and reassurance. So it's like, you know, nowadays we have COVID, we have flu vaccination. So thinking of it, you know, it's just like a vaccination. You are prepared for it and you will feel less stress or when you encounter, you know, um, the same situation again, you will feel, um, you know, less stressful because you, you are expecting that you're not going to feel any pain or discomfort. So I think that's the storyline yeah. of my and, uh, project. Well, brag on your success rate here because you've taken some kids through this and uh, you've been able to get some kids to do this so they don't need general anesthesia. What's your success rate like? Uh, basically, we did a pilot study of 26 cases, 22 cases within the range of age 3 to 10 did not require anesthesia at all. So a reduction in like over 80% uh, for the need of anesthesia in our pilot trial. And that's why the numbers are so impressive that uh, we were lucky enough to secure some funding from uh, an organization in Hong Kong, the Lee Heisen Foundation, to help us promote and expand the project to include all cancer kids in Hong Kong who would be receiving radiation therapy for the next three years. Wow. I, sorry, I've heard the story before, but it's still just, it gives me goosebumps and um, it's emotional. You think about the trauma these kids are going through already 
and then the families, right? And they're they're sick, and as you, you pointed out, and then you got to try and put them under anesthesia every day for 30 days straight. I mean, it, it's amazing the, the children survive the, the treatment itself, let alone the cancer. And so to be able to have a success rate like that and you know, say 80% of those kids not needing general anesthesia and what a huge difference that makes to their treatment. But I want to talk about um, also the students. So the importance of the fact that your students are getting this experience working, um, learning empathy, right? Uh, experiencing real patients and real families uh, and getting to do this in a safe environment, right? In this, say, rehearsal, if you will. Talk a little bit about that and how that's uh, played out for the, for the students and how they've responded to it. Okay, before I directly answer this question, uh, one additional point that will help me bridge in addressing this is just now we talk about general anesthesia and you can imagine that, you know, not all cases will be successful. And one key point of highlighting this project is that uh, reducing the need of anesthesia sounds a very, very attractive impact. But at the same time, even for those who eventually require anesthesia for various other reasons that are medically indicated, the experience itself in the hive actually promotes patient engagement. You know, they have cancer, the carers are very stressed. These are something we cannot change. But at least throughout the journey, coming to the hive, enjoying this 1.5 hour workshop, actually increases patient positive experience, even though they are experiencing something really bad, but at least something positive that leave them in their minds. And at the same time, of course, addressing the carer's needs. So I would really like to highlight that, you know, without the engineers in the IC, you know, we really couldn't accomplish this. And I really want to thank, you know, uh, Jackie's team, to be honest. <laughs> and for that, and reaching into making that answer, you know, not just helping the kids addressing the carers' needs. And you know that in Hong Kong, you know, it's not easy to employ people. So I think it's important that we need human resources for a project to run. And I was very lucky enough to leverage our students. That would be our undergraduate students who will eventually become allied healthcare professionals like radiation therapists and radiographer. So in this process of, you know, studying for this professional program in our department, each of them will be uh, will experience of conducting or organizing this gamify workshops for our children and carers. So throughout this process, they are under supervision by us, by our academic staff and also the working radiation therapists. And throughout the process, they are responsible for designing the game and also the storyline catering to that particular uh, patient needs. So you can imagine that they are directly engaging in the design and execution of the workshop. And throughout the process, because we have carers around, uh, our students will also address to carers' needs. So you realize that, you know, in the hive, it's less stressful because it's not in the hospital. You are not rushing for the next patient. So they will have plenty of time and a more relaxing environment to really address all their needs, not just the physical needs by itself, but also the emotional needs, the need for information, and also, you know, subsequent support that they may require uh, upon uh, command commandments of the uh, radiotherapy journey. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah it's, empathy, as you mentioned. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's not it's, just it's, the knowledge. Yeah. No, it's, it's wonderful work that you're doing. Uh, you know, both obviously for the patients and their families and, uh, you know, the treatment of the, these kids, but also within the university setting and, and giving the, the students and, and everyone an opportunity to, to participate in that and feel really good about what they're doing, I'm, I'm sure. So one of the things that kind of came up there and I realized we, we haven't talked about yet is this term X reality. And I think um, maybe Jackie, you can, you know, help us kind of, um, use that use case, right, with the uh, environment that they're creating for these guys to um, kind of explain what um, X reality uh, means in this environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think it's extend, uh, X reality. People also call it called extended reality, both called XR. So, I mean, there's no precise definition so far, but in general, uh, people use this term as a, uh, 
term for collective of technology, including AR, argument reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. Maybe I can use some simple example to, to explain that. Yeah. First of all, for AR, it's very easy. Uh, uh, maybe we start from virtual reality first. Virtual reality, that means is 100% virtual. Just like when you put on the hammer display. Right. The old one against HTC and Oculus, they don't support see-through. So that's why what you see every day is virtual. So this is, uh, the, I mean, uh, the most immersive technology we experience. For the next one is argument reality AR is the main um, combination between uh, real world and virtual. Uh, the good example is Pokemon. We use a device. It show a screen. You can see the real environment. You can also see some cartoon on the screen. That's AR. AR and between AR and VR. AR, that means um, you can only general is uh, image overlay. Right. There's a limit interaction. Unlike in VR, you can touch something. And for mixed reality, uh, is the overlay between um, the virtual image on real environment, like HoloLens on the screen. For example, um, this is room, is um, uh, no one's there, but in the HoloLens on the screen itself, it projects something like a person. So I can talk to the person. So it's overlay. But I think the most um, Vision Pro, I would say, is the best device for mixed reality. Yeah. Right. So Apple's for new, this mix up, right, new yeah. very expensive headset. Uh, uh, in terms of technology devices, the price is still okay. It's around thirty thousand seven hundred dollars. So, but the technology is very, very good because it can help to create a digital twin world. Digital twin world means combine the virtual world together with the real world. Yeah. So yeah. this is. I, what, I think it's a game changer uh, technology. And, Honestly, yes. yeah, yeah. Vision Pro is going to change a lot of <laughs> things the way people work. But let's get yes. back to the to the hive because the thing that um, I wanted to highlight there in terms of mixed reality. So in in Shara's use case, there was you know, they put an actual table, right? So they have the um, yes. the gurney, if you will, right, that um, mirrors what the child would experience at the actual hospital in the room, so they can practice. You know, lying on yes. it, and then they. But virtually, you see the big, you know, radiation machine that you know yes. rotates. Um, so that's done virtually. So you have this mixed reality, right? I have the yes, real correct. table, and I can really feel it. Um, you know, and I'm lying still and practicing that. Um, yet at the same time, I, around me is the kind of virtual environment that that mirrors the uh, the hospital setting. Um, yeah. I think uh, for teaching this mixed reality, the good thing is because for usually for virtual reality, we can only have a sense of image, vision, mm. without any touching. But because height is talked about, we have 56 meters square. So this is a new um, application. Even our industry partner, we are told that they never do this before to bring the physical item into this cave environment. So that is the allowed user to one, they can um, have the immersive environment and also have the physical touch or physical application of the real items. Yeah. Yeah, no, very, uh, well, it's a distinction, right? Oh, and by the way, you didn't mention this earlier, but I, I recall hearing this when I was there visiting, you guys um, applied for some patents on the design of your, yes. your hive. Uh, how many patents yes. did you get? Uh, we have three. Three patents, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, for IC team and partner, we have two. And for Dr. Sarah, she also got one. All right. Cool. All right. So we've talked about all of the wonderful things. I want to take a moment and talk about the challenges. So, because I know yes. developing this could not have just gone all smooth and easy and everything went right, right? So, um, who wants to tell me a, a story of something that you were trying to do here or um, 
you know, learned along the way, new information, whatever that um, presented a challenge and, and how you overcame it? Well, I just try, try to uh, say something first. I think um, um, the use of the high by Shara, comparing with the use of the high by me, are just telling some of the very fundamental difference of how a, a setting can be made use of in the kind in all this kind of so-called university education. But to be honest, uh, even if we are going moving down to the secondary schools in Hong Kong, some of them do have caves. Of course, not in a high form, such such large uh, size, but cave is already there. So, um, but, well, I've been thinking the entire issue, I mean, the entire exposure to all these kind of materials um, in the past one and a half years. And I've been thinking, oh, what what to do with um, <clears throat> for different disciplines when facing this kind of stuff. Um, for example, like what Sheva has been doing, it is uh, when once I know about what she's been doing, I, I, I could see that it would be so helpful for her because of what she has she has already been mentioned. And I just wonder, well, if if I'm from an active discipline, what how, how best used I can I can be when I'm facing this kind of setting. I know that, as Jackie has been mentioning, more and more uh, courses have been using of, of this kind of environment, uh, of, of this kind of super immersive technology, things like that. But um, are we using it just for the using sake? Or we are really trying to make use of it on all this kind of so-called uh, pedagogical enhancement or revolution, if there is such a case, if there's such a kind of mindset uh, uh, with the teaching staff? Well, to me, I think, um, um, the student may may feel the interest to to expose to this, and they may also have the interest to make use of the spherical camera and things like that. But to be honest, they may even have one at home being purchased by 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 their own family members, things like that. So the entire issue is how we are as a university. We try to let the students know how to make use of um some normal um, um, equipment that they could all, always find around the world of their own on this kind of so-called educational settings or something that can, they can really um, um, link up what's the normal life with the so-called academic life or, or school life. So um, for some disciplines, this kind of facilities would be very useful for some of the subjects, for some of the concerns or some of the talks. Um, but for some other disciplines, this could be much more difficult. But if it is an university, um, if one is talking about um, um, learn out of classroom, one really talks about how we can um, get off from the campus um, for the future educational, uh, for the future, uh, for the future educational trend of, of, of our coming generation. How, how can we make use of this is always a challenge. Um, my, my entire concern is how we can really enjoy into this kind of facilities and know how to make best use of it for educational purpose. Some of the students can do it very easily, but some much more difficult. And and of course, because I'm a social scientist, I, I really hope, hope that this could be a kind of sort of general trend. But how this can be done, um, I'm still figuring it out. I, I can only try out from what I've been exp experiencing and exposing to, but this is one of the challenges that that, that I've in mind. Yeah, I just had a thought. This this popped in my head. Um, is there any use case yet um, where we have the ability to live stream the three hundred and sixty projection? So, in other words, I can immerse myself into a live event um, and appear to yes. be there. Um, uh Please check it. Uh, I can add on this. This is one of our ongoing projects. Uh, we successfully do the live streaming um, in campus. Now we are working on using 5G technology to stream the live, to, to have the 8K live streaming um, video uh, from local or overseas. We are working on that. Okay. Because that would be really cool. You could, like, well, you think about collaboration, right? So I yes, basically correct. have, you know, one classroom, you know, in Hong Kong that's sitting in the hive with a 
or sitting in another classroom, right, with a 3D camera on them, and you've got somebody else yes. in a hive somewhere um, uh, in there, right, displaying I mean, we, it. We, yeah, we, yeah we, we, we managed to do it right now through a third-party server, but the quality is not that good. So that's why what we want to do is to maximize the quality. We do the direct connection. Yeah, uh, you'll yeah. be ready soon, this one. And also, indeed, you talk about is collaboration. The cave is can do more than the video streaming. Indeed, uh, as mentioned, in ProU, we have nine caves. Um, out of this, I'm correct, seven or eight, we are working on the same platform. So we are also working with the developers. So this all cave, they can be um, uh, synchronized. It works now. Oh, yes, so that means <laughs> okay. if we have four people we are in different cave we can play the cast at the same time i mean the technology is available but we are still looking for the um the opportunity uh, to apply for teaching because i also want to uh, I support what uh, ronnie sharing um from our department we realize uh, personally i found immersive technology is the future uh, for field, uh, university teaching, yes. But the problem, the challenge is how to make use of this or integrate with the features, not hardware, with the existing teaching activity, uh, as mentioned by Ronnie, is the pedagogy enhancement. Because personally, I just treat Hive, it's also a toy, it's a hardware facility, just like in kitchen environment, it's just like a cooking pan. What I mean, our engineering team, we provide a cooking pan. But we need a good chef like Shara, Ronnie, and our teacher to have good recipe to mix it with it. So that's why I truly appreciate uh, our team here. Is they are I would say is they are the pioneers um, in our university. They make a very good example uh, to demonstrate how these high technologies can be applied for teaching. So after the work. Um, different, um, we have some uh, new teacher uh, approach us, they also want to use it. And also I would like to appreciate uh, Ronnie because uh, here make a big jump because usually uh, for the hype at the beginning, we expect is the teacher, they'll make this of technology, they prepare material for teaching, but Ronnie and his team bring level up, not only one way teacher, they also encourage or mobile students to do this for assignment. <laughs> mm. So uh, make it is not only uh, it's two way, not only teacher to student, but also uh, a student to student or student to teacher. So thank you so much, Ronnie. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's a beautiful thing, and so it kind of leads me to the next part of my interest in this, right? So. I've been meeting with you know multiple different universities and talking about their uh, learning and teaching you know programs and uh, innovations they're attempting to do on campus. So, and, and what I see is a lot of these programs are kind of in isolation, right? One school is doing this and doing very clever things, and another school is doing something else. And you guys have done this hive, and it's pretty unique. Uh, I haven't seen any other project quite like it, um, and you're finding all kinds of really, really great use cases, um, both the student generated and faculty generated. But how do we replicate this now? How do we take what you're doing and either yeah. continue to replicate it on campus, right? So maybe you, you put a hive in every every building so there's more and more use of it. Um, yes. Or how do you kind of package this up and, you know, here's, you know, other schools can say, oh, here's the the way you do this, here's the materials we need to order um, and, uh, and and go do it themselves. Is that possible to to replicate yes. this, scale it out? Yeah, yeah, Eric, uh, uh, this jacket. Maybe I can also share an uh, interesting story with you because I mentioned is the hype is poly innovation. We work with a staff company, but friends speaking, this staff company coming from a, a, a local famous university the technology itself coming from that. But what's the pretty? Uh, in the last five or six years, um, they, I mean, this company, they tried to promote this technology to their mother university. 
but seems it doesn't work. But so uh, they're very surprised. Uh, once we start the hive, uh, we get the very rapid uh, growth or different application. We uh, thank you for a uh, mark uh, our EDC department to do the promotion. I think for all these, our teammates here, they set very good examples. So that's why it give a, I mean, this successful case study or uh, the experience uh, encourage the new user to come. So that's why uh, for this university, uh, they will also send their student to PolyU next month to make use of the high for teaching. Um, another story is um, in the last 12 months, uh, different universities, overseas universities, uh, they experienced this. They also say, hey, when this technology will be available in the market, they are also the replicate, the first one, they want to uh, have the same uh, facility equipment. Yeah. So we're yeah. working on it. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I do want to break in here. I know, Rodney, you have to go. So um, I wanted, just want to thank you so much for your time today and uh, contribution here to this discussion. It's been great and uh, really, really appreciate all that you're doing there and uh, your, your part in this project uh, and moving it forward. Yeah, I'm sorry that I have to leave earlier. So um, I'll leave it for other teammates to try to share the ideas with you. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right. The last thing uh, I would like to acknowledge, because I mentioned, is uh, the Hive is a joint project uh, between uh, multiple departments, uh, including, of course, around it, applied social science department and computer department, and rehab department, industrial system engineering department, and computer department. Uh, without them, without their support, uh, we won't have the Hive. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah, we are we are supporting each other. Yeah. <laughs> So, and sorry, I, I cut you off there, Jackie, when you were talking about some of the yes, other schools yes. were coming on campus and, and using it. And um, but are they looking at doing something similar on their campus or you're kind of leasing the space Ooh. out to, to folks? Um, what do you think of the uh, future there? Uh, the future will do the commercialization of this uh, equipment. Yes. So, uh, but we're still discussing the patent or something uh, with the company. Uh, maybe hoped early this year will be available in the market. Cool. No, that's that's awesome. I so I want to see it. Right. This is the exactly the kind of thing that I look for for my podcast. Right. Innovation in education, and uh, I can imagine that so many students could benefit from the the environment there and, and these kind of learning experiences that go so far beyond a passive lecture, you know, blah, 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 blah. Somebody's standing there talking to you. Um, you know, we know that the amount of learning that happens, the retention, the impact that, you know, material yeah. has uh, when you're engaged and immersed in it, um, you know, yeah. it's, it's huge. And, you can't compare also it. Yeah. When we, uh, I mean, when we promote this technology in the market, maybe uh, as Sarah and as we previous discussion is, we not only sell the hardware should be together, just like this is we call Hive Light PlayStation Five. Uh, it'll be good if we can create um, to provide service together with the content. So that's why, for example, for Brother Sarah, uh, she's the expert in health. So it's also possible uh, for her to develop uh, the different training scenario for radiotherapy or similar M um, as MRI. So that means we, we not only provide hardware, we should provide a solution. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, what do you think? Um, yeah, that's true. And, you know, recently there are some interesting updates. Yeah, Eric, I didn't have a chance to update you, you know. Just okay. now you mentioned about, you know, our project not only delivers, you know, services, but at the same time, the education part is essential. Not just the knowledge and the communication skills that the students acquire during the workshop. It's more on like, you know, really having a, you know, very personal experience of contacting the needies. This experience is very precious. It's not something that a classroom or even just a place hive to do it. You know, it's, it's a package of everything, incorporating the right person, the right resources. And talking about expansion of incorporating, like, you know, a package instead of just a hardware, 
uh, we are actually developing of you know developing packages as to um, leverage the use of Hive to promote or I won't say to teach, but to um, you know prom I'm maybe promote. I can't think of the best inspire. English word yet, but empathy. Yes, yeah, inspire, promote, or enhance people's um feeling or you know towards empathy. So I think that part is something that is always a an issue for education. How can you quantify empathy? Is is it something that we can we can develop a package and to ensure that people who completed this package will 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 you know will know how to empathize, you know. And I, I don't want to get too far, but I think Hive is a very unique, you know, venue that would help us to to immerse people into specific conditions or situations. And this will enhance their understanding of, you know, one's need. And hopefully that will become a learning package. Yeah. Yeah. Learning package. Yeah. Yeah. So KP, I want to hear from you one more time on your kind of view of the, the future here and the you know shift in pedagogy yes. that can occur as this becomes more uh, expansive, more available uh, to more faculty and, and students to use. What do you see as the, the future there? Well, uh, I was, my first uh, comment is back to basic. Okay, we sometimes uh, say if for our case, we are from the engineer's background with engin engineering training since very young. And then we may have a perception that uh, everything starts with the advanced technology and engineers, engineering techniques. So uh, technology can unintentionally become the core of the solution. And often the user, no matter the students or the, the teacher's needs are put as secondary. So make sure that uh, we what do we want to solve? And then what are the problem statements are? And then how we align with technology to ease the problem, to provide a solutions, and to give a use good and engaging user experience to our students and teachers. And of course, we cannot create extra troubles for them. So the, so the cost offsets the benefits. That's very important. Well, with uh, so if we use the technology, this ad tech, for example, the hive, the cave, especially when we uh, work or collaborate with other other users outside the campus, say a uh, live cast, a broadcast to another cave or the, uh, another hive, we must ensure that, for example, the network and the equipment at the other side of the recipients and that they can deliver an optimal learning experience for them. So pay attention to the benefits, the user experience, and we are solving a problem rather than creating a new problem. And if involving external parties, we call it the digital gap network and some other hardware. And then we must cater for the digital gap because we cannot assume all the learners or the teachers have the same standard or, or the level of technologies as we do. So pay attention to all this and the user experience comes first. Yeah, no, it's a great, great point about uh, the use of technology and that, yes, we don't use technology for the sake of using technology. Uh, you have to have a a real learning objective in mind and stay focused on the student needs. So awesome. Well, I thank you all again for taking the time to talk with me. I know we've been trying to schedule this for a while and it's awesome that we finally got together and did it. And I look forward to my next visit to campus. I'm not sure when that will be, but I will certainly you know, look for you guys. Um, I do get out there occasionally and uh, I, I hope to see you all soon around around the school or around our community here in Hong Kong. Um, you guys got to come out and continue to be involved in our ed tech events in in, in Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sure. Thanks. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay.
my enthusiasm for doing this podcast episode with the folks from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University was justified. The stuff they're doing with this hive is just an incredible example of innovation in education. And I was so impressed by how cross-disciplinary this was. And and I love the way our panelists here were continuing to kind of compliment each other and point out the contributions that you know these various departments have made to make this such a success. And it wasn't lost on me, and hopefully you picked up on this too, that although the tech is cool, this was really the you know the success here was about the engagement they've achieved you know, with students who are creating content. You've got faculty who are requesting to use the facility to create you know unique learning experiences that they can't do in a traditional classroom. Um, and it, it's so much more than a Toys R Us playground here, right? Um, and you've got the university continuing to engage, continuing to support and invest in this tech. So we've got this you know, synchronizing between caves. You've got the live streaming of 360 degree video. This is incredible stuff that they're doing. Um, and it's also important, I think, to note, uh, and this came up towards the end here, we talked about replicating this. Um, the university is actively looking for opportunities to share what they're doing here, right? This is uh, not just the, the tech and how to build it out, right? The facility itself, but to talk about the, the package, right? The education, the, uh, the way you can do this on campus and how you get this collaboration and cross-disciplinary use out of the facility, right? That everybody contributes to this thing. And so if you're on a campus somewhere, right? If you're doing this stuff um, and, and you would be very interested in partnering with the Polytechnic here, please don't be shy, reach out. Let's replicate this thing and have success with this and more learning experiences for students all over the world, okay? So um, I've got some, some video and linked resources also in the podcast show notes. So please look there, scope this thing out. The uh, Take a look, a hard look. And this is the Hong Kong Polytechnic University's hybrid interactive virtual environment okay so check that out and if you're enjoying this podcast please subscribe and share and um this is the beginning of season two now so i've got some great content lined up some great guests coming on we're doing amazing things in education so you don't want to miss that stuff you know and please if you've got comments or suggestions for my podcast please reach out to me i'd love to hear from you I'm Eric Byron. This is the Education Innovators Podcast, and I, I thank you all for listening. And for all of you education innovators out there, thanks for doing what you do. You are making a difference. Hi, Eric. We're back after the recording. Yeah, well, it was fun for me too to watch it again. <laughs> it was uh, it was a great conversation. Um, really smart people. Yeah, it was yeah. really, really interesting to see what you could do with with the space and sort of, yeah, the all the innovation that goes into it, uh, and uh, yeah, I like how a room can turn into something completely different. Yeah, so all the different use cases are are truly amazing, and I do think this is just the beginning. Uh, I think we're going to see these now. Uh, of course, they're willing to share what they've done, um, inviting anyone right to come and. Uh, you know, let them help you do this on your campus. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. And now this is not the only podcast that you've done. So if people want to see more of your podcast, where should they go? Oh, well, so uh, the Education Innovators podcast is everywhere. That's on, you know, all of the major podcast channels, Apple Podcast and Spotify and all of that. Um, I've also got a YouTube channel. If you just uh, go to YouTube and look for the Education Innovators podcast. You can find that there. The other podcast I have is called No Harm in Asking. Uh, that one is audio only, and uh, we haven't done any episodes recently, but it is still out there. Um, there's 39 episodes of that, and that really talks about podcasting. So um, some fun there. We had studying uh, podcasting and, and talking about what we were learning 
uh, on each episode. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, as you said, it's not only you do podcasts, but you can also do podcasts on how to make better podcasts because it's it's an art form in itself. It is, and uh, well, if you watch enough of those episodes, you'll realize that there there is no you know right answer. There's almost no rules. It's uh, almost anything you want to do, you can do successfully. Although there are some guidelines, if you will. There's some things you can do that don't work, but there are mm. many, many, many things you can do that, that work well. Yeah. Yeah. It, and that's always learning from the community. So, um, Eric, big thank you for being yet again a guest at Startup Grind, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future at further events. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Great fun. Thank you. Thank you.